Welcome to TopCast, episode 51. This is part one of chapter 17, Unsustainable, which I presume will go for a few episodes. It's one of those chapters that fits the description that I've heard other people say that sentences in this book could be turned into entire paragraphs, paragraphs could be turned into chapters, and chapters could be turned into entire books. This certainly could be turned into an entire book, this particular chapter, Unsustainable. Sustainability is a huge catch cry of the environmental movement today. It is not only part of the environmental movement, it has now permeated the culture to such an extent that sustainability is regarded as an important moral virtue that people hold. Things need to be sustainable. We need to be able to sustain our existence, not only on this planet, but in our own personal lives. Things have to be done in a sustainable way. So we're told. This is going to challenge our understanding of what sustainability is, the different kinds of meanings that people seem to intend when they use the word sustainable. And sometimes these meanings happen to be at odds with each other. We're going to talk about what's unsustainable and what really is sustainable. And we're going to find that only one thing can really be sustainable. If by what we want from sustainability is survival, not only for ourselves, but for everything else that we care about in the universe. Along the way, we're going to encounter the consequences of the static society lifestyle, why we should want to be an open, dynamic society. We're going to talk about optimism again. We're going to bring back what we've already talked about from the book previously and then use it in order to move forward into the infinite future. Along the way, we're going to encounter Bronowski and Attenborough and compare these two great documentary makers in terms of their underlying philosophy and what the key difference is between them. We're going to see that we're in a pessimistic era. Now, to a large extent, this has always been so. But culturally, at the interface between science, science communication and entertainment, in other words, science documentaries, we're going to see that there has been a recent decline in the kind of positivity, optimism and value of human flourishing that used to be part of the way in which we came to understand our place in reality. And now, unfortunately, it seems as though we are the virus, we are the disease, people are the problem that need to be solved rather than being the solution. We're going to get to all of that. Let's just dive into the book. Chapter 17, Unsustainable, and David begins, quote, Easter Island in the South Pacific is famous mainly, let's face it only, for the large stone statues that were built there many centuries ago by the islanders. The purpose of the statues is unknown, but it is thought to be connected with an ancestor-worshipping religion. The first settlers may have arrived on the island as early as the 5th century CE. They developed a complex Stone Age civilization, which suddenly collapsed over a millennium later. By some accounts, there was starvation, war, and perhaps cannibalism. The population fell to a small fraction of what it had been, and their culture was lost. The prevailing theory is that the Easter Islanders brought disaster upon themselves, in part by chopping down the forest, which had originally covered most of the island. They eliminated the most useful species of tree altogether. This is not a wise thing to do if you rely on timber for shelter, or if fish form a large part of your diet and your boats and nets are made of wood. And there were knock-on effects, such as soil erosion, precipitating the destruction of the environment on which the islanders had depended. Some archaeologists dispute this theory. For example, Terry Hunt has concluded that the islanders arrived only in the 13th century and that their civilization continued to function throughout the deforestation, which he attributes to rats, not tree felling, until it was destroyed by epidemics caused by contact with Europeans. However, I do not want to discuss whether the prevailing theory is accurate, but only to use it as an example of a common fallacy, an argument by analogy about issues far less parochial. Pausing there, just my brief reflection. Immediately notice the key difference between a civilization like the ancient civilization of Easter Island and our civilization today. It almost goes without saying, but sometimes these things, because you're swimming in the aquarium, so to speak, you don't notice the water. We're swimming in this civilization. We don't notice the fact that we are not dependent in the, on the natural environment in the same way, to the same extent, 
as the Easter Islanders were. There is a stark difference here. Sure, in one sense, we need natural resources just as any other civilization ever has, like the Easter Islanders. However, the Easter Islanders, almost like, almost like animals, other animals, are completely subject to subtle changes in the natural environment that they lacked the knowledge of how to counter. Unlike us, if the wind starts to blow too hard, if tonight there's a terrible thunderstorm, which here in Sydney there's predicted to be, I am relatively safe. The natural environment can change quite markedly outside of my house and I can barely notice. I've got climate control here. Nothing like the Easter Islanders had. The Easter Islanders didn't have artificial fertiliser. They were completely subject to whatever the natural environment provided them with. Their knowledge was not able to construct things within their environment to protect them against the forces of nature to the same extent that we can. There is a huge quantitative difference in the amount of knowledge that either civilization had. And of course, there's a qualitative difference in their approach to knowledge as well, as we're about to find out. Our approach to knowledge is this culture of criticism where we are continuously improving things, as David's about to illustrate with the Easter Islanders. Theirs was a civilization where they were singularly unable, because of the ideas that they had, of improving their situation in time before the civilization went extinct, killing all of them. So we are, yes, dependent upon the environment for some natural resources. However, our relationship to those natural resources is such that if they begin to reduce to the point where we begin to run out of a particular resource, we can create the knowledge of how to exploit a different resource such that we can continue to survive an environment which is continuously running out of resources. This is unlike the Easter Islanders, where if a finite resource begins to run out, then they have no means of replacing that particular resource. We, on the other hand, if, you know, the, the classic example, if we rain, rats, begin to run out of wood for burning, we can turn to coal in order to keep ourselves warm. And in the extreme, if we ran out of coal tomorrow, we could turn to uranium. And then we could turn to solar power and batteries. And you might well wonder if we continue to tell this story of our civilization gradually running out of the resources that we have, we can still imagine a scenario where we create knowledge not yet created, which would bring into being another resource so that we can continue to survive. Because if things get desperate enough, our culture of criticism will turn its gaze towards that problem and attempt to solve it in time. This wasn't even happening in Easter Island, as we will come to see. But back to the book. David writes, Easter Island is 2,000 kilometres from the nearest habitation, namely Pitcairn Island, where the Bounty's crew took refuge after their famous mutiny. Okay, better, better just unpack that little bit there for especially readers, I presume, who might be outside of the United Kingdom, Australia or New Zealand, uh, namely if you're in the United States, perhaps. I don't know how famous the bounty story is, unless you happen to have seen the movie or one of the many movies. There's been five movies made of this single event uh, up to today's date. Um, and also Pitcairn Island. You can watch all sorts of amazing documentaries about Pitcairn Island. It's a fascinating place because... Well, the mutineers from the bounty, led by Fletcher Christian, eventually ended up on Pitcairn Island, and their descendants live there through to today. And although they speak English, they have a slightly different accent to other people, they have a strange system of governance, they have this little civilization eking out a living on this tiny little island, very far from anywhere. In fact, there are now, there's some of the, you can tune in on YouTube, you can tune in to some of the in, young inhabitants who, who have YouTube channels and they do live streaming from Pitcairn Island because it's just a fascinating place. It's so far from anywhere else that's civilized, you know, surrounded by the Pacific Ocean. And so, so, so Fletcher Christian's descendants are still there. And who did Fletcher Christian mut mutiny against? Uh, Captain Bly, or at that time, Lieutenant Bly. 
And he's well known in Australia. He's well known in Australia because he was one of the first uh, naval officers sent by sent by the British who were sending their convicts, as many Americans will know. We began as a convict nation. They sent over all of their prisoners to New South Wales. What was then New South Wales, the entirety of mainland Australia was known as New South Wales at that time. It wasn't until later, uh, not until the 1900s, that all of the states, that, which were colonies at that time, were then divided up into the states and then federated into what is now known as Australia. Anyway, that's beside the point. Captain Bly was sent by the British to be one of the first governors of New South Wales. <laughs> and funnily enough, it wouldn't have been funny for him. This is after the mutiny on the bounty, so after he had been thrown off his uh, rather large naval ship into a small life raft, basically, a small lifeboat, little sailing boat, uh, and uh, barely survived to make it all the way home. Uh, it's an interesting story to look up. As I say, there's been lots of movies made about it. But when he did get sent back to Australia, I guess as a reward, <laughs> um, he was tasked with trying to clean up uh, what was known as the well, the rum problem. Uh, the, there, was a, there was an illicit trading of the alcohol rum amongst the guards, amongst the, 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 the Navy sailors, officers, uh, Marines that were stationed here in New South Wales in order to keep control of the convicts and keep law and order. So they started becoming drunkards. Anyway, Bly was tasked with... With, with cleaning this up and he failed. <laughs> he was once again mutinied. He was imprisoned by his own officers and, and, and soldiers and various others. Um, so so uh, he didn't have a whole lot of luck. Now this is all after, by the way, after he had um, accompanied Captain James Cook, who is uh, even more famous than Captain Blyer here in Australia. Captain Cook was the first... Englishman to make it to the eastern coast of Australia to, to discover, you know, the first white person to, to come to Australia in 1770. So he is our, he's our Christopher Columbus, if you're watching this from America. Captain James Cook is our Christopher Columbus, discovered, I mean, scare quotes, Australia. Um, he, he was with Captain Bly on, on his final voyage to Hawaii, where he was killed by the, the locals. Uh, so Captain Bly accompanied uh, Cook on his final voyage, got killed. Then uh, when he was finally given command of his own boat, uh, namely the Bounty, they all mutineered against him and threw him off and he barely survived that. He was then sent to Australia where Captain Cook had actually discovered the place and the locals then that he was supposed to be in charge of, supposed to be the governor over, uh, mutinied against him once more and he ended up going back to England after that. He didn't seem to have a great stellar career, although if you look into Captain Bly's story, um, uh, there are many sympathetic readings of the history of Captain Bly. And some of those movies, out of those five movies, I think I've seen three of them, some are more sympathetic than others uh, when it comes to Captain Bly. Whether or not he was a kind of a nice guy and a good leader or a terrible tyrant, um, history is still trying to decide. So anyway, that's just a diversion on Australia because Pitcairn Island has been mentioned here and the, the bounty. Okay, let's keep going. Both islands, namely Pitcairn Island and, and Easter Island, David writes, are far from anywhere, even by today's standards. Nevertheless, in 1972, Jacob Bronowski made his way to Easter Island to film part of his magnificent TV series, The Ascent of Man. Now, just pausing there again, um, Jacob Bronowski, you may recall his name. Various people have referred to him over time for uh, his great essay about science and values. And David references that, you may remember, all the way back in The Reality of Abstractions. So I just, just want to remind uh, listeners, viewers of the genius of Jacob Bronowski, who David quoted all the way back there in The Reality of abstractions, where David said, For example, as philosopher Jacob Bronowski pointed out, success at making factual, scientific discoveries entails a commitment to all sorts of values that are necessary for making progress. The individual scientist has to value truth and good explanations, and has to be open to ideas and to change, 
The scientific community, and to some extent the civilization as a whole, has to value tolerance, integrity, and openness of debate. Okay, so that's what David wrote about um, Jacob Bronowski back in The Reality of Abstractions. And here he appears again as a documentary maker. And I think if you uh, read um, The Moral Landscape or other things that Sam Harris has said on this topic, he also references um, Jacob Bronowski in a similar way, talking about how Bronowski referred to a scientist as needing to respect evidence, to um, value logic. So we need these moral values. These moral values are, in a sense, prior to the activity of science. If you try to do science, perform an experiment, create an explanation, without caring about coherence, um, evidence, um, truth, then what's the point? Okay, You need to first have a commitment to these values. So it's not like morality can be divorced at all from the activity of science. You, there are things that you that one should do, one should have these values before one can, in fact, find out what is the case in science. Back to the book, David writes, he, Jacob Bronowski, and his film crew travelled by ship all the way from California, a round trip of some 14,000 kilometres. He was in poor health, and the crew had literally to carry him to the location for filming but he persevered because those distinctive statues were the perfect setting for him to deliver the central message of his series, which is also a theme of this book, that our civilization is unique in history for its capacity to make progress. He wanted to celebrate its values and achievements and to attribute the latter to the former. So he wanted to celebrate its values and achievements and attribute the latter the achievements, you want to attribute all the achievements of civilization, our civilization, Western civilization, science and great art, politics, stable societies, to its values, its values of human dignity and the inherent sacredness of life and our commitment to truth, those sort of values. And David goes on. And to contrast our civilization with the alternative as epitomized by ancient Easter Island. The Ascent of Man had been commissioned by the naturalist David Attenborough, then controller of the British television channel BBC Two. A quarter of a century later, Attenborough, who had by then become the doyen of natural history filmmaking, led another film crew to Easter Island to film another television series, The State of the Planet. He too chose those grim-faced statues as a backdrop for his closing scene. Alas, his message was almost exactly the opposite of Bronowski's. The philosophical difference between these two great broadcasters, so alike in their infectious sense of wonder, their clarity of exposition, and their humanity, was immediately evident in their different attitudes towards those statues. Attenborough called them astonishing stone sculptures, vivid evidence of the technological and artistic skills of the people who once lived here. Now I wonder whether Attenborough was really all that impressed by the islander's skills which had been exceeded millennia earlier in other Stone Age societies. I expect he was being polite, for it is de rigueur in our culture to heap praise upon any achievement of a primitive society. But Bronowski refused to conform to that convention. He remarked, People often ask about Easter Island. How did men come here? They came here by accident. That is not in question. The question is, why could they not get off? And why, he might have added, did others not follow to trade with them? There was a great deal of trade among Polynesians, other than Easter Islanders, or to rob them, or to learn from them, because they did not know how. As for the statues being vivid evidence of artistic skills, Bronowski was having none of that either. To him, they were vivid evidence of failure, not success. Then David quotes Bronowski, and Bronowski said, quote, the critical question about these statues is, why were they all made alike? You see them sitting there like Diogenes in their barrels, looking at the sky with empty eye sockets and watching the sun and the stars go overhead without ever trying to understand them. When the Dutch discovered this island on Easter Sunday in 1722, they said that it had the makings of an earthly paradise, but it did not. 
An earthly paradise is not made by this empty repetition. These frozen faces, these frozen frames in a film that is running down mark a civilization which failed to take the first step on the ascent of rational knowledge. End quote from The Ascent of Man, 1973. The statues were all made alike because Easter Island was a static society. It never took that first step in the ascent of man, the beginning of infinity. Of the hundreds of statues on the island built over the course of several centuries, fewer than half are at their intended destinations. The rest, including the largest, are in various stages of completion, with as many as 10% already in transit on specially built roads. Again, there are conflicting explanations, but according to the prevailing theory, it is because there was a large increase in the rate of statue building just before it stopped forever. In other words, as disaster loomed, the islanders diverted ever more effort to not addressing the problem, for they did not know how to do that, but into making ever more and bigger, but very rarely better, monuments to their ancestors. And what were those roads made of? Trees. When Bronowski made his documentary, there were as yet no detailed theories of how the Easter Island civilization fell. But unlike Attenborough, he was not interested in that because his whole purpose in going to Easter Island was to point out the profound difference between our civilization and civilizations like the one that built those statues. We are not like them, was his message. We have taken the step that they did not. Attenborough's argument rests on the opposite claim. We are like them and are following headlong in their footsteps. And so he drew an extended analogy between the Easter Island civilization and ours, feature for feature and danger for danger. And Attenborough said, quote, A warning of what the future could hold can be seen on one of the most remotest places on earth. When the first Polynesian settlers landed here, they found a miniature world that had ample resources to sustain them. They lived well end quote from the State of the Planet, BBC TV, in the year 2000. David continues, A miniature world, there, in three words, is Attenborough's reason for travelling all the way to Easter Island and telling its story. He believed that it holds a warning for the world because Easter Island was itself a miniature world, a spaceship Earth that went wrong. It had ample resources to sustain its population, just as the Earth has seemingly ample resources to sustain us. Imagine how amazed Malthus would have been had he known that the Earth's resources would still be called ample by pessimists in the year 2000. Its inhabitants lived well, just as we do, and yet they were doomed, just as we are doomed, unless we change our ways. If we do not, here is what the future could hold. And David quotes Attenborough again. The old culture that had sustained them was abandoned and the statues toppled. What had been a rich, fertile world in miniature had become a barren desert. End quote. David writes. Again, Attenborough puts in a good word for the old culture. It sustained the islanders, just as the ample resources did, until the islanders failed to use them sustainably. He uses the toppling of the statues to symbolise the fall of that culture as if to warn of future disaster for hours. And he reiterates his world in miniature analogy between the society and technology of ancient Easter Island and that of our whole planet today. Thus, Attenborough's Easter Island is a variant of Spaceship Earth. Humans are sustained jointly by the rich, fertile biosphere and the cultural knowledge of a static society. In this context, sustain is an interestingly ambiguous word. It can mean providing someone with what they need, but it can also mean preventing things from changing, which can be almost the opposite meaning, for the suppression of change is seldom what human beings need. Pause there, my reflection. So before we go much further into this, we have to observe that this entire vision that Attenborough paints for us has permeated the culture so deeply. Attenborough is rightly known as one of the greatest documentary makers of all time. Young people especially love him. They love his voice. They love his infectious sense of wonder about the world, as David talked about there. And the cinematography of a lot of his documentaries is absolutely astounding. You get to see places that you would otherwise never get to encounter. He was able to bring that into your living room, into your life, and so people tend to fall in love with that style. And sadly, they also fall in love 
to a large extent with the message. And the message now is not only part of documentary making, it's, part, it's a deep part of the worldview held by especially scientists and science-minded people. As much as anyone else, there would be few competitors that could rise to the heights of Attenborough who have pushed forward this movement of thinking that we are just like the Easter Islanders. We are at a point where the Easter Islanders were just prior to their demise. We are consuming the limited resources on the earth and everything is about to fall apart any minute. We are in dire straits. The catastrophe is looming. This is the same old Malthusian argument. Perhaps they don't need the graphs that Malthus used. They just appeal to your emotions and to your supposed common sense that clearly resources on the planet must be limited because the planet is of finite size. This is in complete and utter contrast to everything that we have talked about throughout this series and that David has talked about in The Beginning of Infinity and, of course, is the complete opposite to what Bronowski tried to convey in The Ascent of Man. The difference here could not be more stark. On the one hand, we have this vision of resources that are finite and people who deplete them and will only ever deplete them. And on the other, people who are able to discover resources and create knowledge which causes things that otherwise wouldn't be resources to be resources and to ensure that those resources never run out because resources as a whole are effectively unlimited because the universe is effectively unlimited. Uh, you can see my recent podcast, Cosmological Economics, for more on that. And this is a very interesting distinction that David makes here about the word sustain. And it's worth just meditating on this for a moment. On the one hand, sustain can mean, can mean providing people with what they need. Now, what do people need? Well, people don't just need the same thing again and again and again. They need to experience change, development, growth, knowledge creation. And that, to fuel that in their personal lives and at, at the level of a civilization, requires energy, resources. And so we can't possibly be in a situation where Sustain can mean preventing things from changing, which is also a meaning of sustain that people use. But we can't sustain in such a way that things don't change. It must be the case that we have to change, not least because the problems of tomorrow are completely unknown to us today. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The environment itself is going to change. As I like to keep saying, the cosmological event is out there. <laughs> One day, something is going to happen out of the clear blue sky that is completely going to upset us on a lazy Tuesday afternoon. And we will be unprepared for it if we do not create the knowledge because regardless of what we do, the natural environment is going to change. Now, either we can react to it in the moment or we can be the kind of people who prepare for the unknown. We can't simply try to pretend that problems are not going to happen because we know that they are inevitable. As David says, in many, many places, in, at many times throughout the book and in these TED Talks and elsewhere, we need to have a stance of problem solving. If we think we can avoid problems, we're going to be sorely disappointed. We cannot predict what is going to happen tomorrow. We don't know about all of the unknowns that are out there that could cause us problems, whether from the, the blue sky or the blue sea, something is going to happen for which we are unprepared. And the only thing that can ensure or that can help ensure that we do not go the way of the dinosaur is to use the one thing that makes us different, our capacity to create knowledge and to form models of the rest of physical reality. And to do that, we need fuel, we need resources, we need to keep on changing rapidly. We need to make rapid progress. Another way of saying we need change is just to say we need good kinds of change, improvement, progress. All of this requires fuel. It, we can't get this from nothing. We can't just create knowledge without exploiting the world around us and shaping the world around us so that it protects us and nurtures us to some extent from the otherwise hostile universe. 
Okay, and continuing, David writes, The knowledge that currently sustains human life in Oxfordshire does so only in the first sense. It does not make us enact the same traditional way of life in every generation. In fact, it prevents us from doing so. For comparison, if your way of life merely makes you build a new, giant statue, you can continue to live afterwards exactly as you did before. That is sustainable. But if your way of life leads you to invent a more efficient method of farming and to cure a disease that has been killing many children, that is unsustainable. The population grows because children who would have died survive. Meanwhile, fewer of them are needed to work in the fields, and so there is no way to continue as before. You have to live the solution and to set about solving new problems that this creates. It is because of this unsustainability that the island of Britain, with a far less hospitable climate than the subtropical Easter Island, now hosts a civilization with at least three times the population density that Easter Island had at its zenith, and an enormously higher standard of living. Appropriately enough, this civilization has knowledge of how to live well without the forests that once covered much of Britain. Pause there, and I'll end the reading there as well. It's a, it's a little short episode, but it's a nice, neat way to end it here because uh, we go into um, static cultures more deeply here. We take a deep dive into static cultures. Uh, we'll do that in the next episode. But again, David mentions his home there in Oxfordshire and has made the point previously that although you might think that, for example, you know, and when Attenborough goes to Easter Island, he thinks, well, this place is sustaining, sustaining the people that are there. The Easter Islanders were sustained until they did something wrong and they were no longer sustained by the natural environment. We only have to consider somewhere like Oxfordshire in uh, the winter, <laughs> where it is completely inhospitable uh, and you wouldn't survive very long at all unless you had the technology of a modern civilization. Certainly anyone who lives there now who didn't have, who doesn't have the, the, the technology provided by a modern civilization in terms of insulation in the walls and perhaps electric heating systems and uh, ways in which to bring food and water which isn't frozen in pipes and so on. The, envir the natural environment there is not sustaining people at all. What's sustaining people there now in the sense that Attenborough is talking about, the way in which people can survive to some extent, uh, in fact, that's probably all they were doing on Easter Island is just barely eking out a survival. But at least in Oxfordshire today, not only are we surviving, people surviving, they're also thriving, they're flourishing. They, they're, they're creating an open-ended stream of, of, of knowledge creation. But they, they're only doing that. They're only able to do that because they are sustained in this sense by the knowledge that they've already created and the technology they already have. It's certainly not the natural environment. The natural environment contributes something, but it's... But it's also, it's, as much as it's contributing resources and oxygen and, and, and water, it's also contributing freezing cold temperatures. Uh, not enough food in the natural environment uh, for people to survive. Uh, water that isn't clean enough to drink or to make tea with. So there's, there's, there's very little sense in which the natural environment of Oxfordshire is sustaining people. And I might say the same about even Australia, which is somewhat more temperate most of the time. If I was left alone for a month here in Australia with no access to technology whatsoever or modern civilization, I'd be very quickly dead. In fact, I'd probably only last a few days because the natural water that happens to exist around here probably um, would kill me. And certainly if I went to the centre of Australia, it's definitely not going to sustain me. I'd have no clue about how to get water out of the deserts and uh, much less be able to capture any food or eat any food. Most of the stuff out there is poisonous. So I am only sustained, not by the natural environment at all, but rather by civilization, the civilization that is around me. That's the thing that is sort of nurturing me and able to help me to survive. And that's true of anyone who lives in civilization today. Uh, we are beating back the natural environment, uh, which is rather hostile. We've eked, out a resistant, uh, we've eked out our existence so far. So this is the great positive vision that we have of, the, 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 of civilization. Uh, we do not regard the natural environment as being this cuddly thing that sustains us. Rather, it is just a source of natural resources, 
which if we didn't exploit by creating knowledge about how to use these natural resources in new and interesting ways, would quickly kill us. <laughs> because uh, we, we, we need knowledge of how to survive in these environments. And absent civilization, almost none of us would have the knowledge of what it takes to survive in a natural environment. So it's not, that's not what's sustaining us. It's our, it's, our, it's our civilization coupled with our own personal explanatory knowledge to a large extent about how to use uh, the, the benefits of civilization, which is exploiting the natural environment. Okay, that's where we'll end it for today. Uh, somewhat shorter episode, but um, we will continue more with this because it, it deserves, unsustainable, chapter 17, deserves um, special attention, I think, because here we are really... We are really deeply coming up against uh, the culture, cultural memes in many, many ways. We're talking about how wonderful Western civilization is, but at the same time we're saying all the ways in which presently, uh, via the television, entertainment, media, the intellectual community, all the ways in which these aspects of Western civilization are actually telling us, Western culture anyway, uh, are sending us the message that we're the problem. And so this is what David is trying to counter here in this part of the beginning of infinity, and it's an extremely optimistic way of looking at people. All right, until next time, bye-bye.